Hello and welcome back to CST2120 and in this lecture I'm going to introduce you to JavaScript. So the general aim of this lecture um, is to sort of explain JavaScript from scratch um, to people who've had very little exposure to programming. So I realize you've uh, many of you have done, well, you've all done uh, Racket in the first year of computer undergraduates uh, studies, but um, that's sort of more of a functional programming approach, whereas I think, you know, JavaScript, you know, in common with many other languages such as, uh, you know, Java, C++, Python, uh, PHP, you know, they're kind of, I think it's imperative, isn't it? It doesn't really matter. Um, it's a different kind of programming approach. So I'm, in this lecture, I'm going to try and sort of introduce it sort of very gently from scratch and cover it from the kind of extreme basics, yeah? And then hopefully, um, you know, that'll give you a stronger foundation to move forward with, forward with learning JavaScript. Um, obviously, if you know this stuff or bits of this material already, then it's a video, so you can just sort of skip forward, you know, as you need to, yeah? So it's going to be a very basic lecture, um, getting you started with JavaScript. So I'm going to start with an introduction to the language, um, then talk about how variable, variables work in JavaScript. Then talk about functions, uh, things like while loops, for loops, you know, if else statements, that kind of stuff. And at the end, just to give you a little taste of what JavaScript's really used for, um, I'll talk a bit about dynamic HTML. So JavaScript's a uh, programming language that makes websites dynamic. So use the HTML and CSS to give you sort of, sort of the fixed content and the formatting, that kind of stuff. But everything that changes in a website, everything that kind of responds dynamically to user input, all that kind of thing, um, all of that's done with JavaScript in modern websites. So, you know, there was a whole phase of Flash being used for this kind of stuff, but now really JavaScript is the language of the dynamic web, yeah? Most of the JavaScript in the world runs inside the browser. JavaScript itself uh, developed by Netscape. Um, so it's not that similar to Java, except beyond the basic similarities it has with that kind of general style of programming. Um, some people have said, oh, it's a marketing ploy to capitalize on the popularity of Java kind of back in the day. Who knows? Who cares, really? Um, so JavaScript's also known as ECMA script. I think that's the sort of more formal name for the sort of specification of the language. So there's lots and lots of jobs. I mean, my usual sort of techno job search showed up like 118 pages of jobs on JavaScript, you know, at the moment. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, if you learn JavaScript, you know, you'll never be poor, right? Um, so, you know, these are, I didn't sort of look so much for uh, junior jobs here, but, uh, you know, after a couple of years experience, you know, you should be able to aim for something that's, you know, worth about 40 grand, maybe 50 grand, something like that. And, you know, maybe higher if you can, you know, get a, get a nice job in a bank or whatever. So there's a lot of, um, awful lot of jobs in JavaScript, both because it's used front end in the browser. That's probably the majority of the jobs, but also because it's used server side a lot these days as well. So JavaScript's an evolving language. Um, like all, you know, languages, they sort of change over time. New features are being added. And there's definitely a, a net improvement over time. There's a lot of fairly crafty features in the earlier versions of JavaScript, which I never liked. The, the current version of JavaScript is, is far from perfect, things that I would personally change about it. But, you know, I, in my opinion, at least, it's, it's a really brilliant like, programming language. I really like it. And, you know, it's it's a pity, you know, that you can't so easily use it in other areas. So I'd like to use more JavaScript for machine learning, for example. And you can use it for that, but Python's really the go-to sort of language of choice at the moment. So I love it. Um, new features being added all the time. Um, and, that's, and that's generally good. The thing with adding new features, though, is obviously they release the new specification of the language, and then it takes time for browsers um, to catch up and support these latest features, and some of them maybe never do, yeah? You've also got the problem when you're writing JavaScript for browsers that, um, you know, many of the people who are using your website may have an older version of a browser that doesn't support the latest versions of JavaScript. So to kind of solve these kind of problems um, and still work with the latest versions, um, what developers typically do is they write code using the latest JavaScript version, you know, 2017 onwards or whatever, and then they use a transpiler, such as Babel, to convert the, the modern JavaScript that they've written into a JavaScript that can run on older browsers. So transpilers convert one script into another script, or one sort of program into another program. It doesn't convert it down to like a, a low-level thing, like assembler code or bytecode. It converts it into a, another human-readable script, but an older version of JavaScript, you know, typically. You also use transpilers with TypeScript, um, which I cover in my third year module. Okay, so this is the sort of, you know, the various editions. So it's been going, you know, quite a while now, right? 20 years. Um, so the kind of 
as I explained in a second, what we're going to focus on in this course is, uh, you know, from, from about here on in kind of thing. So where we've got things like let and constant, we've got proper classes, we've got, you know, async functions, all this kind of stuff. But as you can see, there's kind of a long history of JavaScript and lots and lots of different versions. <clears throat> So this course is based on ECMA script 2015, so that's what this is, also called ES6. Runs on Chrome, so I've checked all the labs. All the labs support this version of JavaScript, you know, without any transpilation or anything like that. But if you write JavaScript using let and constant, for example, it will fail on some older browsers. Yeah, so if you're using an ancient laptop with an ancient browser on it, it will not run this version of JavaScript. Strongly recommend for this course, you get the latest version of Chrome and stick to that, yeah? So the client side, which is where the majority of JavaScript code is, um, it's used for all, anything that changes on the website. Yeah, we've got transitions, user interaction, animation, form validation, slideshows, dynamic data loading, games, you know, you name it. Anything that goes beyond the sort of, you know, bog standard kind of HTML and CSS stuff is done, you know, with client side JavaScript. So I thought I'd show you a few examples, sort of motivate you kind of thing. Um, if I can get, if my uh, computer doesn't fail me. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. Here we go. Okay, so I don't know why the explorers work. So this is a link um, I provided to you in the in the course website. Oh yeah, that's probably why. So this is a sort of you know fairly sort of fancy, slightly pretentious uh, website written in Italian JavaScript. I imagine I'm pretty confident. I'm looking at the code. Um, so you know it's got this nice loading, all these kind of fancy transitions, and you know uh, presumably if we discover more. You know, we can sort of, you know, you've got this kind of zooming animation kind of things, all this sort of chopped up stuff moving in different directions. You know, some pretty cool effects, right? And then we've got this kind of like a sort of novel um, where I think we can zoom down, right? So, you know, we've got this kind of animation stuff and, you know, a bit of, I think there's a bit of sort of moving about stuff. So this is, I don't know if this is canvas or not, but anyway, so, you know, they created sort of online novel, again, using JavaScript to do all the sort of fancy moving about kind of effects. And this is kind of nice. This is like a, a sort of 400 years sort of history kind of thing. Heaven knows what the graphs are, but anyway, so you can click on different points and see the different events at the different uh, you know points in time. Let's so see first female dentist, for example, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so you can sort of skim through history and sort of see the highlights and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So again, very nice, dynamic, interactive website with some real fancy visuals. That's the kind of stuff you can do with JavaScript in the client. Tons of other things you can do elsewhere. <coughs> All right, so um, to work. okay. So because JavaScript is so cool, um, it's also becoming increasingly popular as a server-side scripting language. So instead of using PHP, .NET, or some kind of ancient Java thing, um, people are using uh, server-side JavaScript. And so the, the advantage of this for companies is that they that their programming teams don't have to you know be specialized in one server side language or one client side language. Their their teams can kind of just learn a single language and then you know it works more seamlessly between client and server. Also, I mean you want to use JavaScript server side because it's cool and beautiful, right? But that's that's another issue because it's way 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 nicer than PHP. I can tell you, yeah. Um, so, and to run JavaScript server-side, uh, people use Node.js, which is like a runtime engine, I think derived from the Chrome runtime engine, um, that enables you to execute the JavaScript, you know, by itself without a browser being present. Um, so Node we're going to cover in the third piece of coursework, and it's a big part of my module next year. And, there's lot, and once you've got Node that can just run sort of without a browser, sorry, once you've got JavaScript that can run without a browser, then you can use it for lots of other stuff. So, you know, I used it for a bit of sort of machine learning last year. You can use it with robotics. You can use it wherever you use any other kind of programming language. So compiled languages uh, like Java and C++ are converted or compiled by a program called a compiler into executable code. So you have C++, which is like the human readable stuff, the compiler then converts that into a sort of binary sort of assembler or a level down would be kind of machine uh, sort of machine code, yeah, which is actually directly executed by the CPU. Whereas JavaScript, PHP and Python as well are kind of scripting languages that are executed dynamically without a compilation stage. So the runtime engine for JavaScript, you know, will work through each line of JavaScript code and then either hit the end or hit an unrecoverable error or it'll be waiting for an event or something like that, yeah. So the actual script is what is executed by the runtime engine, not some kind of compiled version of that script. 
But as I mentioned earlier, um, you have within JavaScript and some other scripting languages this idea of transpilation, which will convert one script into another script. Yeah, So you can even get transpilers that will convert Java into JavaScript, for example. Um, but in the context of JavaScript, you might use a transpiler to convert a, a, uh, some, a script written in the latest uh, version of JavaScript into a script written in one of the older versions of JavaScript. <laughs> So running JavaScript in the browser is pretty easy, just include it in script tags on a web page, or you can have it as a separate file. If you've got lots of JavaScript, you want to put it in separate files, you don't put it all in the same file. And then the JavaScript's executed when the browser loads the page. So this is a sort of very simple hello world example, right? So we've got the standard HTML sort of boilerplate stuff. Then you've got script tags, and then the script tags have got a hello, you know, hello world thing. So just by the way, I'll mention this maybe once or twice in this lecture, you know, I mean, you'll see lots and lots of examples of alerts in JavaScript programming and tutorials and all that. So alerts are absolutely horrendous, yeah, don't, don't ever use alerts. I mean, I left this in because, you know, it wasn't worth changing, but, you know, just generally always use the console, as I'll explain in a little bit. So, um, for a separate file, we could put that same, same code if you have myscript.js, we put the alert in there, then we can link to that script, and then the script is basically sort of included in the page. Um, so when the page loads, it will load that script and execute whatever's in that script. So JavaScript files should always have the extension JS, and you need the opening and closing. I think that may have changed in the latest HTML, but um, yeah, it's something like that anyway. So when you're programming, you obviously want to see what your program's doing. Um, so, um, you know, as I said, the old school way was, you know, displaying an alert. And this is... <coughs> um, and then, you know, this is probably prior to the development of sophisticated debugging tools. So, you know, as I said, don't use that. It's just hideous, you know, because they're going to be blocked by browsers anyway. Um, and again, in tutorials, you often see this kind of writing into the current page, and that's kind of okay if you're learning, it's sort of, you know, but uh, really a bit pointless, um, because obviously you're not going to do that on a real production page. Much, much the better way to do debugging um, output um, is to write to the console using console log. So probably in the Q&A session, or maybe in one of the later lectures, so at some point anyway, I'll explain you how you can actually do debugging within Chrome so you can actually put in breakpoints and, and step step through your code and actually see the variables directly rather than having to write them to the console. But for typically when you're starting, it's generally easier just doing a bit of logging like this, console log, and you can see the output of what your code's doing. So as you know, an alert produces this hideous, ugly box um, that you should never ever use. Document write is okay if you're just learning and following a tutorial. Um, but really the best way is to do console log and then you see it in within the Chrome developer tools and then that's, you know, that's definitely the way to go in terms of debugging output. So JavaScript um, is like, you know, most other modern programming languages, it's case sensitive. So my name written with like that is different, you know, depending on the cases, it, it will treat these my name, these three, uh, these three variable names as different variables because they've got different capitalization. You can start with a letter, an underscore, or a dollar sign. Pretty much never you should start, pretty much, you're never going to want to start with a dollar sign, I wouldn't have thought. It's too much like PHP, right? The underscore might make some kind of sense within some kind of context, but usually just, just don't bother with either of those. Just start it, just, you know, have variables that look a bit like that. Obviously, don't use JavaScript keywords for variable names, you know, you know, you know, you know don't create a variable called for, you know, it wouldn't make any sense at all anyway. Each statement ends with a semicolon. So it's a lot like Java, apart from the typing and some other features, which I'm going to cover in this lecture. So camel case for variables and functions is the recommended way to go. It's nice and clear. And, you know, as I explained in the previous lecture, there's marks for your code's clarity and legibility and all this kind of stuff. So I recommend you give your variables good sensible names using camel case, yeah? And functions as well, yeah? So the start with a small letter, the C here. And then you have the whole word, and then next next word starts with a capital C, yeah? So my variable is written as my variable like that, or my complicated variable comes like that. That's nice and clear. You can incorporate several words into your variable names or sort of truncated versions of that. And that way, you know, you can look at your code and understand what it's doing much more easily. The comments, uh, just like Java, or a lot of other programming languages, uh, single line, double slash. Or if you've got multi-lines or, you know, some convoluted, then you can have the slash star and then star slash, you know, like that. You know, very easy stuff, yeah? Okay.
So I taught a um, second year Java course a couple of years ago, and what really struck me um, is that a lot of students were really struggling to understand what a variable is, which is a very basic thing in programming, but because maybe they hadn't been exposed to it in the first year or for whatever reason, um, they just found it hard to grasp and therefore it was hard for them to sort of use variables in the way that anyone who's sort of got a bit more experience with programming would just do intuitively, yeah? Um, there's a sort of additional problem that, you know, if you've done a bit of Java and you move to JavaScript, the variables are handled a little bit differently. Um, so you've got to sort of get to grips with that as well when you're starting with JavaScript. So in this section, I want to spend, you know, some time, you know, explaining how variables work in programming um, and how specifically they work in JavaScript, yeah? So if you're already super familiar with creating variables and you've got this, you know, you know what dynamic typing in, typing in is and all the rest of it, then just skip this section, yeah? Because it's very basic. I'm trying to go from the very, from the ground up to give, to make sure everyone really gets clear on what, what, what this is about, yeah? So you're working with computers, right? Our computers have a dynamic memory, a DRAM. Um, DRAM contains a large number of memory cells and each memory cell can store a one or a zero, yeah? This is slightly approximate, but it's a, it's a good sort of way of thinking about it, yeah? So when you create a variable in a computer program, then you control some of the memory storage cells. That's all a variable is. It's a way of controlling a memory storage cell. So you can read uh, ones and noughts from the storage cell and write ones and noughts to the storage cell. That's what your variables allow you to do, yeah? So if we had some kind of super mega microscope and we zoomed right in on these DRAM cells, and it's slightly fictional this, but let's suppose we could. Um, we wouldn't see this, but you know, we we you can. It's it's helpful to think of it like this, yeah. So let's suppose we could zoom in and we could look at the deep contents of these DRAM storage cells. You know, we we could see something like this, yeah. We'd see a bunch of ones and noughts, yeah. That that's all that's stored in these DRAM cells, like lots and lots and lots of these ones and noughts. And when we declare a variable in JavaScript, which is done when using the keyword uh, let, um, what we're doing is get control over some of those ones and noughts in one of these cells. So there's complicated low level operating system and you know, chip stuff um, that controls you know, how, how this happens is complicated. Um, but effectively what's happening is um, my variable here, my num, um, is sort of linked up to some of these ones and noughts. So it can, re by manipulating my num, I can control those ones and noughts and output them in different ways um, to the graphical interface. So for example, uh, when I, in my code, I write let my num equals, you know, this bunch of stuff here. What it will do is take those ones and noughts and we'll copy them into the ones and noughts into the into this place in the DRAM uh, memory, memory story cells here, yeah? So pretty straightforward so far. And then if I want to output a variable, that's the writing, and then we want to output it, we do alert my num, um, then in a sort of loose approximate way, what we're doing is you've got some complicated intermediate things, but what you're doing is taking those ones and noughts and then displaying them to the user on the graphical interface, whether that be on the console, whether it be, you know, through an alert or in the, on the web page itself, yeah? So it's taking those ones and noughts and showing them to the user. <clears throat> now, when we do mathematical operations on a variable, um, what the computer is doing is it takes the variable, the contents of the variable, in this case, my num. So whenever I use my num in my code, I'm really meaning manipulate these numbers here. So it takes these numbers here, adds one to these numbers, calculates the result. And then when you have an assignment operator, that's telling the computer to write those numbers into the computer's memory. So it calculates the result, and then it writes them into the computer's memory so that that corresponds to my num plus one, yeah? Now the ones and noughts in a computer's memory can represent lots of different stuff, right? We've got numbers, letters, words, music, pictures, poetry, you know, you name it, right? Within the JavaScript program, the sort of most basic, sort of typical sort of interpretation of the ones and noughts is as numbers, strings, or booleans. Yeah, obviously there's lots of other ways JavaScript can interpret those ones and noughts, but these are the sort of the basic standard ones, yeah? Now in Java and C++ and some other strongly typed languages, uh, the ones and noughts are always, that are linked to the variable, are always interpreted in a specific way. So the ones and noughts in one bit of the DRAM are always going to be a number, a letter, or a string. So, and this is expressed by saying that the variable has a specific type. So when you declare the variable, you're saying that this variable is a number type, or a string type, or a boolean type, or that kind of thing, yeah? And if you want to interpret the ones and noughts in a different way, you have to cast it, um, and then that enables you to sort of move 
uh, work between different types or change the type of a particular variable, but usually the variable is fixed, yeah? So in Java, you know, you've seen this kind of stuff, right? We have a declare a variable int my num. So we're saying that this my num is of type integer, yeah? And once that's declared, that's fixed, yeah? That variable is not going to change its type. You might be able to interpret it as other types, but it's it's fixed in type, yeah? Or here we got my string. So my string will always be of string type in this in this here. So Java will not let us do my num equals my string because we're trying to assign something of string type to a number, and that's just not allowed in a strongly typed language. Um, so instead, we can cast it. So we could cast, you know, the cat's out on the mat as an integer. Who knows what that would actually be? Um, probably overflow. Maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, um, and then that would, um, you know, and then and then we can take a string interpretation of that and copy it into my number. Yeah. So in Java <coughs> and other strongly typed languages, when we declare the variable or we create the variable, um, we declare it with a specific type. And behind the scenes in the Java virtual machine, um, it stores a representation of what type the variable is. And you use that representation of the variable's type to control what you can actually do with the variable. Yeah. So when I go char my char equals a, it takes a sort of the bunch of ones and noughts corresponding to A, <coughs> stores them in the DRAM. Um, in this case, that's the A representation of A. And it also stores that my char is a char type. And the same is true of my byte. It knows it's a byte type. And so it knows that this is, so it stores somewhere in the Java virtual machine that this is a byte type. So if I try and say my char equals my byte, it won't let me do it because the char and the byte are two different types. Yeah. So all, even though these two numbers are the same, um, because they've got different types, they're going to have different behaviors and they're going to have different outputs when we try and output them. Yeah. So when we output my char, because it knows it's a char, it's going to print it out as a letter. And when we try and print out my byte, it's going to print it out as a number because it's a byte type. But the numbers themselves are actually the same. It's the type that determines the behavior um, of the variables as we interact with them in our program. <coughs> now JavaScript handles things very differently. Yeah. So in the case of JavaScript, the type is weak, and it was called weak and dynamic. So we have dynamic JavaScript variables, that's variables that can change, are created with the uh, keyword let. And we can have static, unchanging variables that can never be as changed or assigned to anything else, are created with the keyword constant. So we're mostly going to use let, but constant's handy sometimes. So there's just a single word. We don't, have, we don't declare a variable with int or char or anything like that. And then when we declare it, the browser will dynamically figure out the type of data from the value that's held in that variable. And this can change as the program executes. So if we want to create different variables of different types, we're always going to use let. But then we, depending on what we assign it to, that will create a, in this case, it's going to create a string type. In this case, it's going to create like number types, of different types, like a double sort of integer, sort of floating point. We can create type of Boolean. And also there's types like of arrays and objects and some other types as well. Yes, but we don't have to worry about those later because we're going to cover those in, in a later lecture. So it's always the same let. We don't use int, char, whatever. But then JavaScript behind the scenes will figure out the type and store a representation of what type that particular variable is. So here we have let my string equals a. So JavaScript will say, aha, that's a string. So it's going to, inside the runtime engine, it's going to store the fact that that's a string. So it, no, there are types in JavaScript, but you just don't see them unless you explicitly ask to see what they are. Yeah, They're just handled by JavaScript behind the scenes for you, so to speak. Yeah, And here again, we've got my int equals 97. So here we've got uh, my int, in this case, it's an integer type. Um, and JavaScript's representing my int as an integer type. Now this type can change at runtime. It's not like Java, which is very rigid with its types. Um, it's actually much more flexible than that. So here we've got my int equals my int plus percentage. So in this case, it's, it sees that it executes left to right. So it goes, here's my, my int. So look at the value of whatever that is um, as a number. And then it's got this sort of string concatenation operation. So it's kind of adding a string onto the number. So it's going to reinterpret that as a string add it to this string and return a string. So then it's going to assign a string to my integer. So when it uh, executes this assignment operator here, it's going to convert my integer into a string type when it's completed that operation. So here we've got a sort of dynamic change of um, the type of the variable. So when you add a string to a number, JavaScript changes the variable type to a string, and there's probably other ways of casting it the other way. Um, 
And so you need to be, this can be a little bit tricky because uh, sometimes you'll get unexpected results unless you understand what's going on behind the scenes. So JavaScript evaluates expressions from left to right. So if you look at these different sequences, let's just sort of go through them quickly. So for here we've got uh, let x equals Volvo plus 16. So again, left to right, this is a string. So then we've got a string concatenation operation. So it's adding a number to a string. So it'll convert this into a string and then add that onto the end of this string. So we get Volvo 16. Here, um, we've got, we're starting left to right, so we've got a number added to another number, so that's going to work out as being 20. And then we're going to add a number to a string, so it'll convert the number to the string and do the string concatenation operation. So we get 20 Volvo. And then here we've got a string being added to a number, so again, it'll add the 16 to the end of Volvo to give us Volvo 16. And then we've got Volvo 16, which is a string being added to a number, so we'll convert the number to a string, and then we'll get, uh, like, th these will all be treated just as strings without doing the addition operation there. So this is all 2015 onwards uh, version of JavaScript. So JavaScript used to use uh, var to create variables. So you see a lot of older code using var. Um, for this course, as I said, I think much better to use let. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that, I think. There's a sort of horrible hacky thing you have to do sometimes if you use var and that kind of gets you away with that. So let's got nicer properties, it's more tightly constrained. And it's also got this nice constant which lets you just declare something like pi or something, you know, once and for all in a way that never changes. So if you're creating a sort of standard JavaScript variable that you want to change, most variables do want to change, then use let, um, then you can change it. Otherwise just use um, constant if it's some, something that's never going to change. Now, a variable that hasn't got a value at all, that's never been assigned to anything, has the value undefined because JavaScript hasn't had a chance to work out because obviously the value hasn't been defined, but also the type because the because JavaScript uh, if extracts the type from the value. If it hasn't got a value, then it hasn't got a type either. Yeah. So the type of variable that's not been initialized is defined, and the variable itself um, is said to have the value undefined. So if you're finding yourself getting a bit lost with all this uh, typing uh, type stuff. Um, you can always find out what, what JavaScript um, is in, what type has been assigned to a particular variable by the JavaScript runtime engine. So you can use this operator type of, you just call type of my number, it'll tell you, you know, the type of that, the type of that variable. So in this case, I haven't assigned it to anything, so it's undefined, the type is undefined, the first, first output. Then I assign it to seven, so then JavaScript's going to think it's a, a number type, yep. Then I add um, the number to a string, and that's going to convert it to a string type. And finally, I assign number to a JavaScript object, which again I'm going to cover in the next lecture. And then that's going to be a, an object type. So when you're using strings in JavaScript, um, you can create them with single or double quotation marks, and you can put single quotes inside double quotes and vice versa. But just be careful with uh, quotation marks pasted in from Word or PowerPoint, yeah, because within um, Word and PowerPoint and word processing programs like that, um, they do kind of smart quotes, so you put the sort of first half of a quote and then it produces sort of matching sort of inverted image of it or whatever, uh, and that's not recognized by Java or JavaScript or anything else much because it's a separate, different kind of character, yeah. So here we've got just creating a string with single quotes, creating a string with, uh, sorry, creating a string with double quotes, creating a string with single quotes. Then we've got single quote inside double quotes, which is fine. We've got double quote inside single quotes. You can also escape quotation marks if you get really desperate. Um, and then here, t this is not correct JavaScript and will generate an error. The reason it generates an error is because these are smart quotation marks that have been pasted in from Word or PowerPoint or something like that. Yeah, so you can see these aren't, this, these are a different character and the, you know, JavaScript only recognizes these two characters as quotation marks. Okay, so let's just do a little demo. Um, <coughs> okay, so first thing I want to do is I'm going to use Visual Studio Code for this, um, for most of this, for this term anyway. I might, I might switch to WebStorm for the, for the last few weeks of next term, but for this term and probably for the first half of next term, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is pretty good. Um, you know, I've got no complaints about it really. It's actually written in JavaScript, which is nice. And some, you know, professionals use it, all that kind of stuff. And it's also a big benefit is it's free. It's got a few disadvantages. Um, so if you wanted to do anything 
you know, a lot of the useful functionality is sort of ex implemented in plugins, and then you have to find the plugin, install the plugin, which is a bit of a pain. Um, but in general, I think it's a good it's a good editor. Yeah. So um, here I got Visual Studio Code, and the one that's probably the most sort of useful at this stage in your in your work is this kind of live server one. Yeah. Because what you want to be able to do in JavaScript um, and also in HTML is you want to be able to edit your file in, uh, you know, in your text editor, in this case Visual Studio Code. And then when you save the file, you want to be able to instantly see um, what changes your editing has, has, has made happen. Yeah, you don't, if, you know, in, old, in the sort of old style of web development, you'd sort of edit your thing and then you switch to the browser and then you click reload. And, you know, if you've got a big screen, that's all a bit of a pain, yeah? But with... Uh, Visual Studio Code with the live server, you can just make the changes and then see them instantly happen in the browser, which will save you an awful lot of time and effort, yeah? So I recommend you install live server as one of your plugins. There's lots of other useful ones there. And then I've got a... <coughs> oh, and the other thing is, um, with Visual Studio Code, um, it'll only work, I think, with live server if you've got all your files in a folder and got a folder open. I think you get this kind of blue sort of uh, thing here if you're working within a folder. If you're not working in a folder, then a lot of things will stop working, yeah? So make sure you create a folder for your web development. Um, in this case, where we are, uh, codes. So I've got here introduction to JavaScript. That's the folder that I'm working with in Visual Studio Code. And then within the folder, you put all your files. And then with Visual Studio Code, we'll give you the option to open a folder, which is kind of like a workspace kind of thing, yeah? Okay, so we shove this across. Um, and then, so the second thing I want to show you, so let's just, uh, let's launch this in video, in, in, um, in Chrome for starters, yeah? Um, so let's just do, so let's write, so, we, so what we've got here, we've got a sort of very sort of simple bit of HTML boilerplate, it's not proper HTML really, but it'll do the job. And then just to do simple, let's just do a simple console log, you know, hello world or something, yeah? Okay, so because this, uh, I'm going to save this, yeah, and then with Visual Studio Code, um, yeah. So let's just let's just close. We can we can switch off here at the bottom if you can see it. Um, here at the bottom, you've got this kind of go live button. So when we click on go live, it will then start up the server and open up the web page that corresponds to this here, yeah. Now. Um, so the second part you're going to need for JavaScript development is the um, Chrome developer tools. So we're going to open up, one way to get them is to click on this little dotty thing, go for more tools and then developer tools. That'll open up at the bottom here. And there's also a shortcut, control shift I, I think it is, yeah? So um, just to show you how, to, so now we've got everything set up. Yeah, we can see the console, which is our output from our JavaScript code. Um, and we've got it set up. So we make any changes here. So if we do hello to world, you know, it'll instantly reload it here. So we can see, you know, any changes we made to our JavaScript. And, it, and I'll tell you, this is way, 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 way faster than the sort of traditional thing of switching between browsers and reloading and all the rest of it, yeah? So at some point in, in, uh, in all this, um, I'll show you the debugger. So what we could also do if we wanted, we can sort of, um, we could sort of debug our code here. So here I've I haven't got any. Co let's just create a variable here. Actually, on uh, let's you know my var equal you know hello whatever, and then we'll log out hello uh, yeah whatever it's really matter. So save that, um, and then we can go into uh, that's oh yeah we go yeah. So then you can kind of do breakpoints, and we can probably do a watch here right. Um, probably this is a bit spectacle, speculative, um, my var, right? Okay, so let's get rid of that breakpoint. Um, let's just refresh it. Now why, oh, that's because I haven't spelled it right, yeah. Right, so there we go. So you can actually, another way of debugging it is, you know, can add like watch, watch statements here and we can sort of step through the code and all this kind of stuff. But for the moment, keep it simple. We're going to use the console for just console output like that, yeah? Okay, so let's just um, see my viable, um, my var, and we can do uh, console log uh, type uh, of, I think it is, yeah, my var. So we can also see the type of that. If we go back to my example, so we can see that's type of string, 
and if we didn't assign it to anything, um, then it's type of undefined, right? And if we assigned it to, you know, three or something, um, then we get type number. And if we assigned it to true, uh, then we take the type boolean. So these are the main types you're going to be working with. And we could even, you know, type of object probably, um, you know, uh, name Sam, Sam, something like that, yeah. Okay, so then that's a JavaScript object, yeah. So you can use type of to see the types and they just kind of manipulated and changed at runtime. So I think that's probably, probably enough of that. Okay, so hopefully um, variables are kind of clear enough for you to be able to work with them and understand how the typing works in JavaScript. So next thing I want to cover um, is functions. So functions are just a way of wrapping up a block of code um, so that you can call it multiple times with different parameters, yeah? Um, and functions can also be used to calculate stuff, return data, and so on. So here's a very simple sort of basic example. Here we've got, so with JavaScript, you just declare a function. You don't need to declare, declare the return type, which you do in Java. And here's a function called say word. It's got one argument parameter, it's a slightly ambiguous terminology um, here called word. And so, and then we call that function by using the name and sort of use our smooth braces. And here we're passing cat into the function and here we're passing dog into the function. And so this will give us, so we call it using the same block of code to say this is the word cat and this is the word dog. So arguments, um, so word in this case here is an argument to the function. Um, so we can pass strings, numbers, booleans, arrays, objects, whatever you like really. Um, and so we can copy, so we can either specify this explicitly as like the number three or the, you know, the string dog, um, but we can also put variables um, in our function calls. And then what will happen is the value of that variable will be copied into the arguments of the function, or the parameter of the function. So this is all some confusing terminology, but it's really quite easy to use, yeah? So we're calling the function say word, in this case, we're specifying cat as the argument to that function. So the string cat will be copied into this variable word, which is the parameter of the function. And then word will have the value um, here of whatever we passed into the function. Yeah, so in this case, it's saying this is the word cat. And so the reason it does that because cat's copied into word and we're outputting word here. And the same true with dog. So with uh, sort of basic variable types like strings, booleans, numbers, that kind of thing. Um, what happens when we call a variable with a call a function and pass a variable as an argument is it will do what's called pass by value. It'll copy the value of the variable into the function uh, parameter and then that'll that value will then just be manipulated within the program or used within the sorry used within the function. Another way of saying this is to say whatever happens in the function stays in the function. So this is true of numbers, strings, and booleans, but not objects and arrays. So to try and explain that here with, with an example, I think it's a little easier, yeah, because I realize it's kind of a bit confusing, yeah? So here we've got a function increase number. The sort of parameter um, for this function um, is number. So number x is a sort of local variable, a variable that exists within that function, yeah? So when I call, so here we're creating a, a variable my number, and we're outputting the, the value of that, yeah? So in, in this case, it's the output of this program is the value of my num is seven, because I've just assigned it to seven, right? So that should be fairly straightforward. Now we pass in call uh, increase number with my num, okay? So what happens here? So my num has the value of seven. So seven, so it takes the value of my num and copies that into this uh, parameter here, number. And then this number then will have the value of seven. So it says here, the original value of a number is number. So that's seven because it's copied the value of my number into number. And so it's outputting seven here. And then the second, we, and then we're increasing number here within the function. And then it's logging out that the increase number value is, is number here, yeah? But now, but this is, uh, yeah, that's what's doing there. But now, at the end of this program, I'm doing console log, the value of my number is my number. Um, and what it's outputting here is seven. It's not outputting eight. The reason it's not putting eight is because all that happened with the function is I copied the value of my number into this variable here. It's effectively a variable um, and did some stuff with that. My number wasn't changed at all by the function. Now, this would be different if it was an array or an object. In that case, um, the array of the object might be changed within the function, and then the changes would persist when the function had, uh, had exited. 
but in the case of simple stuff like strings, numbers, and all the rest of it, it just copies the value into the into the parameter of the function, does stuff with it, and then it's just thrown away. Yeah. So, so in this case, um, it hasn't changed my num at all. So with JavaScript, you can return data from functions, um, and you can also recall call return if you want to just exit from the function at any time. So again, we're not working with types here, so you don't have to specify the type of the return data. So we've got uh, here a function that adds numbers. It sort of takes two, two sort of uh, parameters, uh, number one and number two, and creates a new number that's the sum of them, and then returns that. So here the result is the we call the function add numbers with 10 and 11. We'll add them up, return them, and then the, re the result of the, what's returned from add numbers will then be assigned to result, and then we can like log it out there. So something again you need to be clear about with JavaScript, you don't have it so much in Java because everything's kind of within classes in Java, but in JavaScript um, you can have the completely global variables that exist declared outside a function and can be accessed anywhere within your JavaScript code. And so they're sort of global to the page. So if you go to a different page, those global variables will cease to exist, but within a particular page, um, within the browser, um, these variables will exist as long as the page exists. And then we also have local variables that exist within a function and would completely disappear when the function ends. And you can also have variables local to classes. And even if you just create a pair of curly braces and put a variable inside there, then it ceases to be local, it ceases to be global and becomes a local variable. So where a variable exists and accessible, it's known as its scope. So it's very important to know where a variable is valid and where it's not so that you can use it appropriately. So here we've got um, our add numbers function. So here we've got a variable that's declared outside of any functions, outside of curly braces, all the rest of it. So this here is a global variable, result. Result's the global variable here. And then we have a local variable here um, inside a function. So ideally, in your code, you should always aim to have local variables and very few, if any, global variables. When you're starting, it's understandable you're going to have a lot of stuff in global. Um, but particularly when you start including third-party libraries or creating complicated libraries of your own, you're going to get what's called clash between, you know, your different global variable, so sort of namespace clash, sort of thing is called. You kind of have um, where you've got your variables might have the same name as someone else's variable, and then they're going to do weird things and interact in strange ways. So it's much better if all of your code has, is sort of in, it has a limited scope. It's not got global scope or you're going to get into trouble, yeah? But as I said, when you're just starting out and it's simple pages, it's fine to have stuff in global scope. Now, if you use a variable without declaring it first with the let or constant keywords, then that variable comes global. And this is something they should fix in JavaScript, really, because it's really more of a bug than a feature, I think. But anyway, um, so in this case, let's suppose we've got a, a, this variable here, let new number equals this. So this is currently a local variable, yeah? So if I, if I try and access that variable outside of the function, um, what it does, it gives me an error. New number's not defined. And that's good behavior, yeah? Because this should only exist within the function. But if for some reason I forget to put let in front of new number, and then I log it out, um, then actually it'll tell me that, that it exists, yeah? Because suddenly it'll magically create a global variable um, because I forgot to put let in front of it. So ideally this should create an error, but it doesn't. Um, and so you can get messy stuff if you forget to include let in front of, um, in front of a variable. Okay, so I'm going to go through this bit fairly quickly because I think it hopefully, if, particularly since some, most of you have done a bit of Java by now, um, this should be becoming fairly obvious, but I'll just go through it just to make sure it's all clear. So we're doing with blocks of code we kind of want to check if certain things are you know as we expect them to be and then do some kind of branching depending on that and so conditional is a way of kind of finding out if if something is great is true in some way yeah so you might want to check that age this variable age has a value of less than 14 or that cost is greater than equal to 12 and so on and so forth so we can make see if things are greater than less than or equal to and all this kind of stuff yeah we can see if two things are the same, like this animal variable, has it got the value bear or does it not? Or is the value not equal to bear and so on and so forth. So I think this stuff should be fairly straightforward. The thing that you need to know about JavaScript though, is that it's got two different ways of writing equals. And that's very, it's very important to understand what these are, yeah? So we have the double equals. In this case, JavaScript would have its own sort of complicated set of rules um, where it will, it will compare the values so if the types match, it would just compare the values and return true or false if it's equals or it doesn't equal. But if the types don't match, 
um, then it will still try and compare the two the values of the two variables. It'll it'll sort of try and convert a string to a number or a number to a string or do what it can to see if there's some kind of match between the two variables. Um, on the other hand, if you want to see see if there's a the variables match both in type and in terms of value, then you use triple equals. So in general, I recommend you use triple equals everywhere in JavaScript um, because it's always better to compare both the type and the value rather than rely on the sort of behind the scenes sort of hacky guesswork that JavaScript might be might be doing for you. So let's look, just look at an example. So here, so we got here we've got a variable whose age um, equal to two. So obviously that's going to start off having the number type, yeah. So if we compare age to two. This is a, a number type value two. This is number type value two, so it's going to evaluate to true. Now here we're using the double equals to compare a string of a number um, with a no so this is a string type, but value sort of two kind of, and this is a number type value two. So because JavaScript can interpret this string as a number with a value two, it will evaluate this to true because it's got this kind of flexible type matching. Now here we're using triple equals, which I said I recommend you use in your JavaScript. Um, so here we've got, uh, it's a number, type is number, the value is two, type is number value two, so this again evaluates to true. But if we're using the strict comparison here, um, here we've got number type, type of number, value two, type of string, value something a bit like two, but because this is type string and this is type number, this will evaluate to false. So this is a much safer and more rigorous way to use JavaScript rather than just the double equals. We also have logical operators, which you're probably familiar with by now, so we can see if A or B is true, or A and B is true, not A is true, and um, here A and B can be booleans, or they can actually be expressions, so if A is greater than 7 or B is less than equal to 9, then the, that whole expression will evaluate to true. <coughs> So we've got, you know, variables here are booleans, true and false, and so var1 or var2, since one of them is true, that's going to, the whole expression is going to evaluate to true. var1 and var2, not true, is it, because one of them is false, and not var2 is true, and so we get the output there, yeah. We also use um, while loops, for loops, um, to execute blocks of code multiple times. While loops are used typically when you're just checking a single condition, um, to, whether it's true or not, um, and, and while loop can kind of be in, execute indefinitely, whereas you use for loops uh, more typically for you know running a block of code a fixed number of times. So here we've got like sweets equals five. So as long as sweets is greater than naught, it'll sort of do something. In this case, eating a x output eating a sweet, and then it'll sort of reduce the number of sweets, and then eventually sweets will hit zero, and then it'll log all the sweets finished. So <coughs> a for loop probably be more appropriate for this. But, you know, you might use a while loop to execute something continuously until the user does an action, for example. So for loop um, is usually, you know, used to execute a block of code a fixed number of times. And there's lots of other ways of doing other, you know, you often, people do use it for ex sort of moving through all the values in an array or something like that. But generally, there's better ways of doing that. So here we've got a for loop. Um, so you have the first stage, which is like you create a very a local variable called i, which only exists in the for loop, that's the advantage of let, this will be local, whereas in, uh, if we use var, I think it becomes global. Um, so we create a variable i, initialize it to naught. This is the condition, so the for loop will execute as long as i is less than 10, and then we increase i by 1 each time that we go around this for loop, yeah? So the first time we go around i is 0, so if i is 0, i is less than 10, so that's fine, we'll do it. Then it increases i by 1, and then the next time does a check, see if his eyes are less than one, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so this will do that, what's inside the, four, the curly braces here, four time, uh, ten times. We often want to check if a condition's true, and if it's true, we do one, some, we do one thing, otherwise we do something else. That's what these kind of if-else stuff, so we're going to check in here if number equals four. It'll log out that, otherwise do that, otherwise do that. So hopefully, again, this should be fairly straightforward kind of code, and if you're not familiar with it, you should just have a play with some examples, yeah? And we've got is if else, and again we're using if else, I think we've got highlights here. Um, so we're saying if that's true, we're going to do that. Now if we didn't have these curly braces here, um, then we would only do this first line of code here, and it would always do the alert, yeah? So they sort of wrap up a block of code and link it to this particular if statement here, yeah? Um, whereas in Python, for example, you know, you'd, you'd, the, the indentation would be enough, but that's not the case in JavaScript. So you need to use 
curly braces if you want to wrap up multiple lines of code together um, and tie them up to an if statement or an else or a for loop or something like that. Okay, so let's uh, let's do a little demo here. Yeah? Might as well. Um, I think I'm still in, still stuck in um, still stuck in here. Okay, right. So let's go back to here. Right. So that's my demo. Right. So let's just do. I don't know. Uh, oh yeah, that was what I was going to do. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, let's 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 write just to do something a little bit more fancy here. So, okay, so let's write a function um, is even right uh, num yeah something like that. If so, I'll explain what it's going to do in a second. Num slash uh, two equals naught return. Okay, so. So we've got a function here, is even, um, and this will so we're passing in a number here. So if the this this percentage thing here is called an integer division, I think it's called something like that. Uh, and so what this does, it'll tell you what's left after you've divided the number by two. So if we've got number three, for example, after we divide it by, by two, um, there's one left over. Yeah, it's like the remainder that'll give us. Yes, yeah, so if the remainder after dividing by two is zero, then it's an even number, and that's what we want to determine here. And if it's uh, other, and otherwise, we don't need to do an else because we just want to return uh, anyway. So if that's not true, then we're just going to return false. Okay, so now we're going to do for loop. <coughs> uh, i equals naught. i is less than ten, for example. Um, i plus plus. And then we're going to do uh, console. Uh, so we're going to do i, we're going to output i, uh, what we're going to do, 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 is even, and then, so I don't know it's a particularly smart way to do this, but it'll do, yeah? Um, okay, so, so here, I might have to pull this out a little bit, okay, um, so we're working through so setting i to naught, I listen to I'm going to work through numbers from naught to nine here. I'm going to output i, and then we're going to say whether it's even, um, and then we're going to call the function is even, and that should output true or false. Yeah. So if we save that. So we're saying naught is even is true, one is even is false, two is even true, and so on and so forth. So we've got a nice little for loop here, and we're doing the sort of conditionals here to evaluate something, and we're calling the function kind of within the for loop. So nice sort of simple bit of JavaScript just to sort of you know, uh, uh, so yeah, just to show you then if, if it's supposed to be if else, so I could return false is more efficient, right? But I could do else here and return false, and it would give give exactly the same results. Right. So last bit of lecture, you know, client side JavaScript, we're using it to change the web page. Yeah, we're not just you know the user doesn't want to just see a load of pretty stuff out in console console log, right? It's all about dynamic HTML. So I just thought I've got I'm going to cover this in much more detail in the subsequent lectures, but I thought I'd go into a little bit of this um, just to introduce you to it and give you a taste of what JavaScript's really about. Yeah. So we're going to create a very basic dynamic web page to start with. Yeah, and the easiest way to do this is get the HTML element an ID. Lots of different ways of doing this, but this is one basic way to do it. And then there's a JavaScript function built into the browser called document get called get element by ID. So the browser within the browser you have access to a document. Um, and the, that within JavaScript, that lets you access what's called the document object model, which is kind of representation of the HTML in, inside the inside the browser. So document has a bunch of built-in functions that lets us sort of search for IDs and classes and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to cover that later, as I said. So we can get a using this document get element by ID. We can obtain a reference to the HTML element, and we can then change the inner HTML of that element. So here's a very, very simple example. So here's this kind of boilerplate HTML, and I've added in here um, a paragraph with an ID, my ID, and the contents of that paragraph is currently dog. Yeah? So firstly, my JavaScript can use this document get element by ID to, get, to get, obtain a sort of a variable that points to that particular part of the document. Yeah, so my paragraph is now pointing to this part of the document in the document object model. 
And then using inner HTML, I can then change the inner, what's, what's between these tags here. Um, and so instead of dog, it's gonna have the word cat. So if I actually run that code, instead of seeing dog when I load the page, because it's very fast, um, I actually see cat, yeah? And if I disable JavaScript, I just see dog instead, yeah? So to show you something slightly more exciting, um, I'm gonna sort of add in just another function. So this is a function also built into the browser um, called setInterval. Um, so setInterval will call a particular function um, every uh, uh, repeatedly with an interval um, specified here in milliseconds, yeah? So if I wanna run my function every second, I call setInterval with my function, the name of the function here, and a thousand here because it's a thousand milliseconds and there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So here's my little example. So again, I've got the para paragraph for the specific ID starting at zero here is the contents of this HTML element. Then I've got a, within my JavaScript, I've got a variable that represents the, you know, the counter that I'm counting. I get a reference to that um, paragraph, a variable pointing to that paragraph in document object model. I've written a function here that all that function does is increase counter by one. And then what it does is it changes the contents of this paragraph here. That's what this inner HTML stuff's doing, as I explained before. And then we call set interval. I, I say that I want to call this function, uh, call this function every thousand milliseconds. That's what that's doing there. So very simple, easy bit of code, but hopefully it shows you the sort of dynamic, you know, web page stuff. Yeah. So let's just uh, let's just show you that, and then we're almost done, I think. So here's my web counter demo. So it's not rivetingly exciting, um, but you know, it does show you it working. Yeah. So if we switch switch off the go live and switch it back on. It should launch it up here. And then here on the right, we can see the web counter here um, um, increasing and it'll sort of go on forever kind of thing, yeah. And maybe get rid of that as well, okay. So that's just a very simple example um, of a dynamic web page. And obviously, and all the sort of beauty you saw in those sort of examples I gave you at the beginning of the lecture, you know, that's just more complicated versions of what I just showed you. So I do rather like this website. Um, I haven't really fully explore, explored it in terms of the introductory material, but I've certainly looked at it a lot when I've been doing more advanced JavaScript stuff and it's been very good. So good chance that, you know, you'll find some really useful material that'll get you started in JavaScript here. Um, it's completely free, just, you know, have a look at it. Um, and again, this, this is a book that's well reviewed and has a lot of sort of detailed ex explanations of how JavaScript works, um, but I haven't, you know, gone read it from cover to cover. So I couldn't, you know, can't comment on whether it's the most, you know, the most eloquent book on JavaScript. As usual, I kind of give you a bunch of resources. So, um, you know, basically some, there's some few JavaScript tutorials. I mean, the W3 school one's probably pretty good. There's some video tutorials there um, and various other links that might be useful. Okay, so this lecture, I've introduced you to JavaScript, which is used to create dynamic interactive web pages, as well as, you know, working on a server using Node.js. And the next lecture, I'm going to go into sort of JavaScript data structures to so take a look at JavaScript arrays, objects, and also JSON, which is like a way of representing JavaScript objects like a, as a string.